Hello everyone. Let's analyze. Soups complete me. Or how the least upper bound axiom completes the real line. So we return to the task of axiomatically constructing the real numbers. We know that the axioms of an ordered field are not sufficient since the set of rational numbers satisfy all of these axioms. We need one more axiom to generate the real line. But before we get there, we need uh, just a bit more vocabulary so that we can all talk the same language. So an upper bound is, well, it's an upper bound. An upper bound M of a set S is a number that's greater than or equal to every element of the set. A lower bound, little m, is less than or equal to every element of a set. Okay, so an upper bound and lower bound means precisely what you think it means. So a few examples. Let s be the closed set 0 to 3. Now, when I say the closed set 0 to 3, what I mean is every number that is greater than or equal to 0 and also less than or equal to 3. 0 is a lower bound because by definition 0 is less than or equal to all x in my set. But so is negative 1 because negative 1 is less than or equal to all elements in my set. In fact it's strictly less than all elements in my set. In fact all real numbers less than or equal to 0 are lower bounds. Of all lower bounds, zero is the greatest one. 42 is an upper bound. 42 is strictly larger than every element in my in S, which means it is greater than or equal to every element in my set. 3 is also an upper bound. Of all the upper bounds, and there are many upper bounds, there's infinitely many upper bounds, 3 is the least one. Let S be the set closed interval 0 to open interval infinity. That is, the set of all numbers greater than or equal to 0, which of course means 0 is less than or equal to all elements of my set. So, of course, 0 is by definition a lower bound. There is no upper bound. So, oh yes, you had a question? How can we prove this rigorously? Well, I'm glad you asked. Suppose that M fancies itself an upper bound of S. That means that M purports to be greater than or equal to X for all X in my set. But if M is greater than or equal to x, and x is greater than or equal to 0 by virtue of being in the set, then by transitivity of the greater than inequality, m is also greater than or equal to 0. Now, since m is greater than or equal to 0, it is by definition in the set. Now, remember, 0 is less than 1, right? That was the stunning conclusion of our first lecture meaning that if I add m to both sides, my inequality remains. So m is less than m plus 1. Now, as we can see, m plus 1 is greater than m, and m is greater than or equal to 0. So we've concluded that if m is an upper bound, then m is in my set and is bounded above by m plus 1. So how can m be an upper bound of the set if there's a number in the set, specifically m plus 1, greater than it. So if m is an upper bound, it is also not an upper bound. But that's impossible. Therefore, the original flight of fancy of m, that it's an upper bound, is an impossibility. And now we've come to our axiom. 
which we'll call the last axiom we're going to call the least upper bound axiom or completeness axiom. The set of real numbers is an ordered field with the least upper bound property, which is every subset of real numbers with an upper bound has a real least upper bound. So as we've seen, if a number has an upper bound, then it has infinitely many upper bounds. Well, of all of those upper bounds, there's the smallest one or a least number. And that would be the least upper bound. And every set that's bounded above has one. The reason this is also called the completeness axiom is because it completes the reals. In fact, we'll see later on in the semester a equivalent definition of completeness, which means that there are no holes. If a sequence of real numbers converges, it must converge to a number. It can't converge to an empty spot. For example, the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is no longer an empty spot. The square root of 2 is, in fact, a number. There are no holes. Now, when we say a set is bounded with neither an upper or lower qualifier, we mean it has an upper and a lower bound. So the set of integers is unbounded. The set of natural numbers, that is, all positive integers, also unbounded. It has a lower bound, but no upper bound. Any finite set is bounded. Now let's just consider that statement for a second. Any finite set is bounded. Because it's bounded, it has both a lower and an upper bound. Because it has an upper bound, it has a least upper bound. And of course, the least upper bound would just be the largest number in the finite set. OK, a max and a minimum, they mean exactly what we think they mean. The maximum of a set is the greatest element in the set. So big M is a maximum of S if it's both an upper bound and in the set. A minimum is both a lower bound of a set and in the set. So a few examples. The finite set of numbers 1 through 10, rather the finite set of integers 1 through 10, the maximum is 10, the minimum is 1. Okay, fairly straightforward. I hope you all agree. The closed interval 0 to 1. Oh, by the way, I keep saying closed interval, and again, we know what that means. All numbers greater than or equal to 0 and also less than or equal to 1. Now, the idea of closure or close has a specific meaning, and we're going to explore that meaning later in the semester. So the maximum is 1. 1 is greater than or equal to every element in the set. Also, 1 is in the set. And 0. 0 is less than or equal to every element in the set. 0 is also in the set. Now consider the open interval 0 to 1. All numbers greater than 0 and all numbers less than 1. In this case, although S is bounded, it has neither a maximum nor a minimum. But it's bounded. We should be able to describe in some way the bounds. Well, that brings us to our next definition. A real number X is called the least upper bound, and we discuss the least upper bound well just a few minutes ago in the least upper bound axiom. A least upper bound, or to those in the know, a supremum of a set S is, as its name suggests, the least upper bound. So the least upper bound is the least upper bound. Of all upper bounds, it's the least. So if X is the least upper bound or supremum, then x is both an upper bound of s and it is less than or equal to all other upper bounds. It is the least upper bound. So we'll also call this supremum or 
we'll call it soup for short. But the best way to read it, even if we read soup as, the best way to think about it is as least upper bound because that's a really explicit uh, definition. The definition is the name. It's the least upper bound. I imagine you can guess what the greatest lower bound is or emphemum. The greatest lower bound is, of all lower bounds, the greatest one. So if y is the greatest lower bound of a set S, then y is a lower bound, and it's greater than or equal to all other lower bounds. We'll also call this the emphemum or the inf, but even when we write inf or emphemum, we should read to ourselves greatest lower bound because again the name is the definition. So just as a few examples, let S be the finite set of integers 1 through 10. The supremum is 10 and the infimum is 1. Right? Because 10 is an upper bound and of all upper bounds it's the least one. 11 is an upper bound, 12 is an upper bound, 42 is an upper bound, but of all my upper bounds, 10 is the least one. Let S be the closed interval 0 to 1. Then the supremum is 1 and the infimum is 0. Notice that this set has a min and max in the previous example we looked at. The min and max is also the infimum and supremum in this case, respectively. Now consider the open interval, 0 to 1. This set has neither a min nor a max, even though it's bounded. But we can describe the bounds by the supremum and infimum. There is no min or max, but there is a supremum. The supremum is 1, and the infimum is 0. Of all upper bounds, 1 is the least upper bound. Any number less than 1 cannot be an upper bound. Every number greater than 1 is an upper bound, but, well, greater than 1. 1 is the least of them. So in this theorem, we're going to give an equivalent supremum definition. Now, you may notice that I've called this definition a theorem. Well, why did I call this one a theorem in the previous definition? Because we're going to prove that this definition is equivalent to the original definition I gave. So I could have given this first as the definition and then the definition I gave previously as a theorem. But what we're going to prove is that if a number satisfies the definition on the previous slide, it must also satisfy these two conditions. Suppose S is a non-empty subset of R. Then B is a supremum of F of S if and only if B is an upper bound and for all positive epsilon, there exists an x such that x is greater than b minus epsilon. Okay, so there's a lot of jargon, especially in that second statement. So what are we trying to say? Maybe the best way to read this equivalent definition is we're saying that there's no sunshine between a set and its supremum. Let's see an illustration of what's meant by that. So suppose S is illustrated by this interval that has an open upper bound at B, the red dot. B is the supremum of S. If we look at the right edge of our set and B, no sunshine, no space. Because if we were to take B and move to the left by any amount, right? In other words, when I say move to the left, I mean B minus epsilon. Then there's an element of S to the right of B minus epsilon. In other words, greater than B minus epsilon. And that's precisely what's in the theorem statement. That any shift of B to the left means 
that that leftward shift no longer is an upper bound of S. There's an element of S to its right. So there's no room to move. So how would we prove this? Well, first, let's illustrate the proof. And by the way, this is a good technique to begin a proof, especially if you don't see immediately how to begin, is to illustrate the idea and then turn that illustration into a formal proof. And that's what we're going to do here. So here we see sunshine. There's space, right? There's some space for sunshine to pass through between the edge of S and B. So B can't be a supremum then. Because I could move to the left and get an upper bound of S that's less than B. So we see the idea. Now let's give a formal proof. Now notice that in my theorem is an if and only if statement. That means really I need two proofs, one in each direction. I need to prove that if B is a supremum according to the original definition, then B satisfies conditions one and two. And then I need to show that if a number B satisfies conditions one and two, then it must satisfy the original definition of a supremum. So first we'll give the proof in the forward direction. That is, we're going to show that if B is a supremum, according to the original definition, then B must satisfy conditions one and two. Okay, condition one is pretty straightforward. If B is a supremum, remember, the way to read that is B is a least upper bound. The second two words of that phrase, least upper bound, is upper bound. So by definition, by the original definition of a supremum, B is an upper bound. So condition one is straightforwardly dispatched. Now, for the sake of contradiction, let B be a supremum and suppose condition two is false. Now, of course, if this theorem is true, that can't happen. We're going to show that what can't happen is an impossibility to show that it does happen. In other words, we're going to show that it's impossible for B to be a supremum and for condition two simultaneously to be false. So suppose that that happened. What do we mean that condition two is false? Well, we have to negate condition two. Now, of course, we've all taken an introduction to proof writing, so we know formally what it means to negate a statement. But let's just think about it in a straightforward way. If we say condition two is false, we say for all epsilon, there exists an x in my set S that's greater than B minus epsilon. We're saying that that's false, right? So the statement that for all epsilon greater than zero, something happens, if that's false, it means that there is an epsilon greater than zero for which the remaining statement is false. So there's an epsilon for which there exists no x greater than b minus epsilon. If there is no x greater than b minus epsilon, then for all x, x is not greater than b minus epsilon. And if there is no x, in other words, if every single x fails to satisfy x is greater than b minus epsilon, then for all x, x is less than or equal to b minus epsilon. So we arrive at the negation. Now we have all seen the formal rules for negation, but again, we should just think in a straightforward way, what is the original statement and what would it mean for the original statement to be false? Right, if we say for all epsilon something happens, if it's false, then there's an epsilon where it doesn't happen and doesn't happen, what does it mean? Right, there exists an x such that something happens. Well, then for all x, it never happens. So we showed that if condition two is false, b minus epsilon is greater than or equal to x for all x in my set. 
Therefore, by definition, B minus epsilon is an upper bound of S. B minus epsilon is also less than B. This contradicts the supposition that B is the supremum. In other words, this contradicts the supposition that B is the least upper bound because B minus epsilon is a lesser upper bound. Thus, if B is the supremum of S, then condition two must be true. In other words, it's not possible for B to be the supremum of S. In other words, it's not possible for B to be the least upper bound and for two to be false. So we've proven that if B is the supremum of S, then conditions one and two must be true. Now we have to prove the other direction. Our goal now is to show that any number satisfying conditions one and two must be a supremum of S. Now suppose conditions one and two are true. So B is an upper bound of S and for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists x in S satisfying x is greater than b minus epsilon. By the way, if you're not familiar with this notation, the upside down a, that means for all. It does not mean anarchy, despite what you may have heard. It means for all or for any. The flipped capital E means there exists. And this uh, stylized E means is an element of, or uh, maybe the most simplest way to read that is, is in. So again, this says for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an element X of S satisfying X is greater than B minus epsilon. Again, we will continue this proof by contradiction. So. Suppose that B does satisfy one and two, but that B is not the supremum. In other words, if B is not the supremum, but B is an upper bound, because condition one says B is an upper bound. So if B is an upper bound, but not the least upper bound, then there is a lesser upper bound out there. Let's call it D. Since D is less than B, B minus D is positive. Let's name that quantity epsilon. So epsilon is defined to be B minus D, which is greater than zero. Condition two implies that there exists an element X and S such that X is greater than B minus epsilon. All right, remember, we're supposing that condition two is true meaning that if I go to the left of B, I can find an element in my set that is to the right of B minus epsilon. Now, of course, epsilon is B minus D, and that gives me just D. Now, wait a second. D purports to be a lesser upper bound. But X is an element in my set greater than D. D is a fraud. It is not at all an upper bound of S. And of course, we have our contradiction. Therefore, if B satisfies both conditions, it must be the least upper bound of all upper bounds. And we've shown our result. So we now axiomatically have the real line. The real line satisfies the axioms of an ordered field and the least upper bound property. So now that we've built it, what can we do with it? Well, so much. To find out more, stay tuned for lecture three. That's all for today.